Tonight, families raise concerns as the SHA moves patients from hospitals to private care homes to free up space. Also, a plea for support from the family of a man seriously injured by an impaired driver. Plus, thousands gather in prayer across the province to celebrate Eid, marking the end of Ramadan. This is CBC Saskatchewan News. It is Wednesday, April 10th, and the CBC Saskatchewan News starts right now. Good evening and thanks for watching. A new government program is moving people from hospitals into private care homes. It's causing concern for families who didn't know this was happening. They found out about the placements after rumors started swirling about an alleged attack at one of the homes. Priya Bhatt brings us the latest from Mormon. The Saskatchewan Health Authority is moving patients who need an alternate level of care into this facility. Diamond House is a private personal care home. Seniors with all levels of need live here, right up to level 4 care. Diamond House came to our attention when we received reports that a senior was allegedly attacked by a new resident here. So far, we haven't been able to verify the event. The Ministry of Health says they're investigating the allegation, but RCMP says they're not aware of any such event. People are concerned. Larry Adams's both parents live here, and he says what's unfolding at the facility is bizarre. As a family member, we're trying to understand, you know, where these uh, new residents are coming from and why the environment within the facility has changed in a negative way. The new residents are part of an ongoing agreement between three care homes and the Saskatchewan Health Authority. It falls under the city's capacity pressure action plan to free up hospital beds. The SHA says these once acute patients will have their needs met here. They're no longer um, needing the kind of the level of care that they would receive in a hospital, uh, but they still receive some degree of um, support, support with eating, getting dressed, um, kind of walking, those kind of things, uh, simple wound care, um, potentially uh, individuals waiting for um, some type of surgery, um, IV treatment um, um, where they could be non-weight bearing. 75 beds have been added in and around Saskatoon for these patients. 30 of them are at Diamond House. And it's not free. It's based on income and could cost a patient up to $3,300 a month. Diamond House declined to comment and their ownership group Golden Healthcare was unreachable. Larry Adams says his parents have been here less than a year and this isn't the first issue. In approaching the manager of the facility about our concerns, my family member was treated abruptly and told to, if they weren't happy, to move my parents out. I mean, this is not the solution for the overcrowding of hospitals. One senior's advocate says using care homes to relieve capacity issues at hospitals might be a short-term solution, but it shouldn't be a permanent fix. He says for seniors to be protected, there needs to be proper supervision and unannounced inspections. We need to be assured that uh, not only is there the proper training for staff and others uh, to handle these kinds of or to prevent these kinds of incidents, but, but that they are being carried out and, and on, a, on a regular basis. And we don't have the assurance in this province at the moment that that's actually happening as much as it should. Van Gorder says policies should be in place so seniors are treated with respect and dignity. The patient who was allegedly attacked has moved out of Diamond House. No word on what will happen with Larry Adams' parents. Priya Bhatt, CBC News, Warman. Regina parents came to the legislature today renewing concerns about a shortage of pediatric gastroenterologists in our province. Caitlin and Jordi Soron say their two-year-old daughter has to go to Toronto to see a pediatric specialist next month. There are no such specialists in Saskatchewan. The province lost its only pediatric gastroenterologist last year. The couple says they have had to lobby the health system for referrals and now are responsible for the travel costs to Toronto. 
We do have uh, the SHA working on, on finalizing, I believe, two contracts for a pediatric gastroenterologist. Um, the time frame, I'm not exactly sure on, on that, but I think that's, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're hopeful that we'll have that uh, concluded uh, so that we can have uh, the proper uh, staffing complement there to make sure that we are staffing that particular program the way it should be. It's exhausting. It's been a full-time job. Um, but like I said, any parent knows that you'll do anything for your child. I, the, I don't have it in me to stop. I won't stop until she gets what she needs. Health Minister Everett Hindley says the Health Authority is in the process of signing two contracts to fill pediatric gastroenterologist vacancies. According to targets that are set for pediatric specialists at the Jim Pattison Children's Hospital, there are 15 vacancies in various areas. Victims of impaired driving and their families need more supports. That's the message from the family of a man badly injured after a collision last year. Darnell Findate was hit by a vehicle as he walked across the Saskatoon Street last April. He's now unable to walk or communicate. His mother, Charlene, spoke at a news conference today at the FSIN office in Saskatoon. She says there needs to be more help for victims' families. My life was impacted very tremendously and I'm still struggling. I'm still trying to find a way to help advocate for my son because I am my son's voice now. Young boy. FSIN Chief Bobby Cameron says there also needs to be harsher penalties. He says Saskatchewan continues to see an epidemic of impaired driving and is hopeful people will start to realize the consequences of their actions. The FSIN says the driver was convicted and given a sentence of two years to be served in the community. Two vehicles, two bicycles, two children. There were two similar incidents at the same intersection near a Saskatoon Elementary School this week. The kids are okay now, but some parents are concerned about the safety of that intersection. Ashwari Duda has the story. We saw a vehicle stopped right over here, and there was a bike uh, trapped underneath it, crashed. There was a child sitting on the side uh, being comforted by some adults. It happened here around 8.30 Monday morning, just a block away from Willow Grove School. Parents say this is a bad intersection. Jindy Klein has seen two accidents happen in two days. The first one was a 12-year-old girl. She was hit on her bike. She hurt her arm, but she's okay. The child on this side was visibly shaken up. They were bent down, sitting on the side of the road, uh, and it looked as if maybe they... I was told later there was an ambulance that came. The second accident happened the very next day. This time, a nine-year-old boy. He wasn't hurt. He fell into a vehicle that was stopped at a stop sign. Now, the school also knows that this is a bad intersection. They've sent letters to parents, and the community association has sent its own letter to city council. Parents say the issue with this intersection is that it's confusing. The signs are not clear. Um, a lot of people don't know whether they have to turn or go straight from which lane. Uh, and then on, uh, you get a lot of people coming the long way down the one way. As if that's not enough, Klein says lunchtime traffic has picked up since teachers withdrew Noonar supervision. That's part of their ongoing contract dispute with the province. Klein wants to see crossing guards before and after school and larger signage. The city recognizes that the crossing is difficult. It recommended a pedestrian crossing button through the Willow Grove neighborhood traffic review. It also recommends more signage and markings. For now, Klein is telling her kids to be extra careful. Ashwarya Duda, CBC News, Saskatoon. An emergency shelter in Saskatoon was the topic of an, at times, emotional meeting at City Hall today. A City Council committee discussed a recent report into the shelter's impact in Fairhaven. A report by the police service and fire department suggests violent and property crime spiked shortly after the shelter's arrival. But that crime rate is now trending down toward levels seen before it opened. This is where you need our stories. If you want a complete picture about what is happening in Fairhaven, you need to understand it's not that crime is normalizing or decreasing. It's because 
Crimes are no longer being reported because it's futile to do so. It is so difficult for me to imagine a wealthy housed person feeling more unsafe than someone with nothing living on the street and also having the police constantly enforcing the policies made, made in these rooms filled with more suits than hearts. Pierce says there needs to be a structured shutdown of the shelter in Fairhaven. Saskatoon's mayor says that's not going to work, but also says there does need to be better dialogue and problem solving with the people who live there. The federal government is bracing for a repeat of last year's devastating and record-breaking wildfire season. Today, several cabinet ministers unveiled Ottawa's plans to prepare for the worst. Lindsay Duncombe has the details. It is getting warm outside across much of the country. Whatever snow fell has melted or is melting, and federal ministers sound nervous. We can expect that the wildfire season will start sooner and end later and potentially be more explosive. This is what officials are worried about, a repeat of last year. Eight firefighters died, 15 million hectares burned. That's seven times the annual average. Smoke blanketed the continent, the entire city of Yellowknife forced to flee. This is what conditions look like now, dry across much of the country. Extreme drought conditions in parts of Alberta, the Northwest Territories and BC. Just how dry? Check out this riverbed in Prince George, British Columbia. Adding to the risk, predictions of above normal temperatures in the weeks and months to come. This is really an all hands on deck moment. This is not, uh, this is not something that any level of government can address on its own. First Nations are especially vulnerable. Training programs and additional staff are helping many communities prepare. If we have persistent dry weather and no precipitation, yeah, then I'll, I'll, I'll get nervous. Um, and for me, the biggest thing is to have my crews ready to go. And ahead of next week's budget, the federal government announced it is doubling the tax credit for volunteer firefighters to $6,000, potentially more cash for those on the front lines. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Vancouver. Oh, big day for fans of golf in Regina. The Murray, Goulet and Tor Hill driving ranges open up today. An effective Saturday, 18 holes at those three courses will be open too. The other nine at Tor Hill and the Lakeview Par 3, not quite ready to go just yet. But for those opening, you can book tee times now. We'll be back after the break. Welcome back. A week after the deadly earthquake in Taiwan, a Canadian couple is counting their blessings after a near-death experience. They were hiking near the island's east coast when the earth shook, leaving them fighting for their lives. Philippe LeBlanc has their story. It was supposed to be a magical vacation for the young couple, Taroko Gorge being the perfect backdrop to celebrate Lilia's 34th birthday. It's just so incredible because you're walking and it was stunning, it was gorgeous. But suddenly last Wednesday morning, the earth started to shake, causing landslides. Lilia and Brandon had to fight to survive. And she took a look at my head and saw that there was blood coming from it. So uh, luckily she was smart enough to uh, rip her shirt and use it to and tie, um, tie a bandage around it to help stop the bleeding. The young woman from Montreal suffered a fractured vertebrae. The man from Edmonton broke a foot and had an open skull fracture. Driven by survival instincts and adrenaline, they said, they walked two kilometers before being evacuated with other hikers. We arrived to this spot where there were shelters where they have um, food and normally there's vendors selling souvenirs and stuff like that. Uh, we actually found the other 10 survivors. Um, they were all protected there and they said that there no rocks had come in that area. I was like, uh, yeah, seeing those people was like Christmas morning. I mean, <laughs> the group of 12 hikers was then taken to a Hualien hospital where the couple will stay for at least 10 more days. The big thing for me is they're just worried about infections since it was such dirty, a dirty wound. So they're giving antibiotics every day. And yeah, same thing as Lilia, just making sure blood pressure is okay. The young couple says they've been overwhelmed with love and support. It's the first time I'm experiencing so much of um, 
I don't know how you can say that, but like kindness from strangers. Um, and it's, it's, it's very pure and it's very genuine. Lilia and Brandon say they aim to recover quickly from this traumatic experience. Philippe Leblanc, CBC News, Taipei. This weather update is brought to you by Titan Automotive, proud member of the Capital Automotive Group. And our weather specialist, Ethan Williams, joins me now. It looked like it really wanted to rain in Regina, but I didn't see anything. No, uh, we had a few showers uh, here and there uh, through parts of the province today. But, uh, of course, the big story of the day uh, for us weather-wise, especially in the south, has been the wind. Very, very gusty at times. Over 50 still right now. We had a gust over 80 in Estevan a little bit earlier this afternoon. It was expected to continue uh, through the evening. In terms of those showers, yeah, starting to move through uh, eastern sections of south and central today, pretty much uh, where we thought they were going to be. Much of the rest of the province starting to see cloud cover move in. There were even a few strikes of lightning this afternoon, along with those uh, storms, those little uh, cells popping up in the southeast corner. Those have now mostly moved into uh, Manitoba or are now moving stateside uh, for the most part. Temperature-wise, though, uh, many of us getting into the double digits again today. This is about uh, what our expected daytime highs were. You can see things are really dropping off in the north, though, getting close to freezing in some places, but still uh, 10 degrees, double digits for places like uh, Kindersley, Moose Jaw, and Yorkton right now. And uh, it is no surprise that we have been above seasonal for this first third of April here. In fact, in Regina, uh, we, usually in the month of April, we get about 17 or 18 days where we get above 10 degrees for a daytime high. We've uh, all, in fact, all 10 days so far in the month of April have been above that. And again, we're only about a third of the way through the month here. That warmth not limited to Regina. In Saskatoon, usually we see about 10 or so nights above uh, the freezing mark. And uh, so far we've had seven of those nights above freezing. And there are still more to come in uh, the days ahead here. We know it has been warm and it has also been dry. And uh, unfortunately, as we go through the night uh, tonight, those showers going to be moving out tomorrow. We're left with mostly sunny skies. Will be a nice day, though, tomorrow, especially sky wise as things begin to clear. And then uh, our next system starting to move into central and northern Saskatchewan as we head into Friday morning. That will likely be mostly a rainfall event, despite uh, this model picking up some snow here. We'll see increasing cloudiness, though, through southern Saskatchewan for uh, south and central for Friday and then Clearing out in the south as we head into Saturday, central and northern Saskatchewan still cloudy for the first part of the weekend. Rainfall amounts not going to be much, though. Again, we're probably looking one to three millimeters at the most, maybe pockets of five millimeters or so in uh, east or uh, pardon me, northeastern sections of the province as we get through the weekend. Still a bit breezy at times in uh, southeastern Saskatchewan tomorrow. Gusts uh, up to 40 kilometers an hour, including in Regina. And then things really starting to pick up again as we head into Friday. And going forward, wind definitely going to be the story here. But a nice day tomorrow, 12 degrees under mostly sunny skies in Regina. The weekend starting to cloud over a bit, but temperatures getting near 20 degrees. And then a pattern change. Beginning of next week, some more significant moisture moving through and maybe even some snowfall with cooler temperatures and wind as we head into Tuesday, Wednesday. Saskatoon. Almost complete sunshine for you tomorrow. And then to uh, start the weekend, we're looking for the possibility of some showers or flurries with that system that moves through central and northern Saskatchewan. And then you will catch that next system into the beginning of next week. And yes, maybe some overnight temperatures below the freezing mark. So uh, very above seasonal conditions uh, for now, Sam, but uh, more April-like weather to come. I could do without the snow, but mm -hmm. I will welcome the rain. Yeah, we all will. That will be Fingers crossed that actually happens. All right. Thanks, Ethan. You bet. Well, for the fourth time in six seasons, there will be a new voice of the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. Veteran Saskatchewan broadcaster Dave Thomas will be taking over the play-by-play -play duties for the football club. Luke Mullender will return to the booth in the analyst role. And Justin Dunk and Wes Cates will be the hosts of the pre- and post-game shows. Their first official broadcast will be the preseason game against Winnipeg on May 20th. We'll be back after the break.
There are new concerns about the safety of Boeing airliners. A whistleblower claims there are construction flaws in the 777 and 787 passenger jets. It's the latest in a growing list of concerns, and for the second time this year, the head of Boeing is being called to appear in front of U.S. lawmakers. Cameron McIntosh reports. They're among the top-selling wide-bodied jets in the world. Boeing's 777 and 787 Dreamliner, manufacturing processes for both now being investigated by the Federal Aviation Administration. I am hopeful that the FAA will not allow this to go unanswered. Boeing engineer Sam Salafor alleging the 777 could have damaged parts. That changes to manufacturing of 787s could leave fuselages with improperly closed gaps. I literally saw people jumping on the pieces of the airplane to get them to align. You certainly don't see that in Boeing's corporate videos. Boeing denies Salifer's allegations, along with allegations from his lawyer. He was threatened with physical violence. He was threatened with termination. Salifer worked in the same South Carolina plant as another whistleblower, John Barnett, who also raised concerns about the 787. He was found dead in his truck in March of an apparent self-inflicted gunshot wound. Boeing, meanwhile, is reeling from recent mid-flight scares. A 737-800 engine cover falling off just this week. A 757-200 suffering wing damage in February. And that 737 MAX 9 losing a door plug in January. The largest aircraft builder in the world. Orders were up last month despite its troubles, which have slowed production schedules. And it's probably going to take a long time for them to get out of this because, again, you have to change the culture. And they have to go back to a more safety-oriented culture. Boeing's CEO has announced his retirement later this year. Salifer has been invited to testify in Washington next week. I'm doing this not because I want Boeing to fail, but because I want, I want it to succeed and prevent the uh, crashes from happening. Although there is an investigation, neither of the planes have been grounded. Boeing insisting it always works with regulators. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. And Ethan's back with one last look at your weather. And we'll be left with mostly sunny skies already at 8 a.m. tomorrow in Regina, just above the freezing mark. And uh, winds uh, still a little bit breezy at times uh, from the northwest. It'll be a bit of a brisk morning. Uh, those will pick up a little bit again into the afternoon, likely at times close to 40 kilometers an hour. But sunshine in 8 degrees by the noon hour. Saskatoon completely cloud-free by tomorrow morning. Winds a little lighter for you. I think it'll be quite a nice day. Temperatures uh, already near double digits as uh, we head toward that noon hour. And speaking of the sunshine, beautiful shot of the sun from Maryland uh, near Bradwell, just southeast of Saskatoon uh, along the highway the other day. And uh, you're going to be seeing a lot of that over the next uh, couple days, Sam, with these uh, nice conditions. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Ethan. You bet. And before we go, a special day for Muslims across Saskatchewan, marking the end of the holy month of Ramadan. Allah Eid celebrations are underway across the province. Thousands of people gathered in Saskatoon at Prairie Land Park this morning. More gathered in Regina at the Conexus Art Centre for morning prayers. With so many people interested in gathering, both cities held more than one time option for ritual prayer so that everyone could participate. While Eid celebrations are a time for community and joy, many at the gatherings spoke of the ongoing war in Gaza and prayed for a ceasefire and lasting peace. And that is it for us tonight. For news anytime, you can head to cbc.ca slash sask or slash Saskatoon. You can subscribe to the CBC Saskatchewan YouTube channel or you can download the CBC News app on your phone or tablet. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great night.